This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange with me, Arthur Parkinson and Sarah Raven. And today we are going through our spring and summer 2024 range of plants, bulbs and all kinds of beautiful things for the garden because what's wonderful about each season is Sarah launches all these beautiful things that together we've known about for sometimes a couple of years. Mm. So it's so exciting to see all these beautiful new varieties and some old favourites uh, return and get us really focused onto the growing year ahead. So Sarah, what's your first pick of the collections? So I'm really glad that you suggested us doing this because it is fun to go through and really make your top of the pops sort of list. And for me, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that last year, the dahlia that I just thought was unbelievably, extraordinarily beautiful and stylish on top of the ones, I mean, you know, excluding the ones that we breed, which obviously I think are lovely because I wouldn't have bred them otherwise, but is a variety called Night Silence. And it's actually bred by a guy called Peter in the Netherlands. And I've done a bit of work with him recently on breeding some other varieties. But I always find going to his field really enlightening and exciting because he often has something that is just jaw-dropping. And actually, we found one in his field in August 23, which I'm incredibly excited about, which we're hopefully going to call Sissinghurst. But anyway, Night Silence came from him. And the thing that's unusual about it is its texture and it's very kind of matte. It reminds me of a beautiful slate slab that you might have in your kitchen or on your doorstep or whatever. So it's got that really sort of putery matteness to it in dark crimson, but it's not gloomy. It's got this sort of sheen over it, almost like Molly Raven. So a bit of sort of pinkness through it that makes it lighter. And it's very interesting. You know, I take so many people around the garden here when the dahlias are at their best. And particularly the people that I think of as the most discerning all fell on this one saying, wow, what's that daily? I've never seen that before. So daily and night silence, incredibly flowery, good vase life, very stylish. Yeah. I mean, for me, an absolute total top winner. What about you? Well, I am, I'm taking over a raised bed in a neighbor's garden this summer, Mm. which I'm really excited about because it means I can hopefully have a lovely row of of favorite dahlias and um i went to a an open house this was it december i think i went to a house called leeton house which is near holland park in london oh yes i'm sure you know of it and i'd never been to it before i knew it because there was a stuffed peacock apparently in this house yes but there's the most incredible um it's called the arab hall which is full of, (gasps) of 17th century tiles yes and i walked in there and i just immediately thought of the the daily collection we put together last year which has been called the the marrakesh daily collection yes which i put together when when we're on shoots i'm always rustling around sarah's desk and office finding vases and lovely magical things that are normally hidden by paperwork and (laughs) godness knows what um (laughs) but i found a little tulip area didn't i yes and i picked tartan which is the most incredible sea urchin flecked with white and it's a huge head And I paired that with um, two others. It was Verona's Obsidian and a new one called Tangerine Dream, which I wouldn't normally like because it's almost like, um, it's a very Muppet-like dahlia. It's white and orange, but it's got a beautiful shape to it. Yeah. And paired with the the starriness of Verona's Obsidian with its gorgeous honey centre and the the craziness of Tartan, they kind of just worked like a crazy... Not a carnival. It was more the very. There's a depth to these three varieties put together in the vase. Yeah. So I'm excited about growing them. Just thinking about bringing them into the house. Yeah. Yeah. So that collection. Yeah. 
gosh, that's so exciting that you're going to do a raised bed. That's really brilliant. I think it's... Yeah. <laughs> I, I did a, a new 20 by 20 foot patch here just for me to play around with and teaching through it and sort of engaging back in. I did a um, an online course with Create Academy, who, who you've worked with as well. And I, I just absolutely loved having this patch that was just me and I just looked after it and I picked from it and... It really re entranced me with the whole thing. I mean, I, of course, I, I love growing cut flowers, but actually, me doing all the staking, all the mulching, all the sewing, all that. And I've actually chosen one from that patch uh, for my next choice, which is Melope Trifida Vulcan, which is that beautiful mallow like flower with the green eye. And I had it, that I, I grew the seeds and then this, and pricked out the seedlings, et cetera in a tray next to Scabious Black Cat. And I then planted them together. And I knew the Melope would go over by the end of July because it's a hard annual, whereas the Scabious often goes on practically until Christmas. But in a way, I didn't mind because um, the, the Scabious is, is so pretty and I direct sowed um, some dill to take over from the Melope, which is a beautiful contrast to the Scabiosa as well. So I called it the Lush and Luscious Evenings Collection. And actually, I had really a lovely time us growing the flowers for my assistant's wedding here. And she absolutely fell on that combination. So Melope Trifida Vulcan and Scabiosa Black Cat. Um, what a beautiful pair of seedlings to grow together in a border or as a cut flower. So, yeah, I really recommend those. Yeah, the scale of them both together is perfect, isn't it? Yeah. Beautiful, really, beautiful really heart great. and then dancing. And also out your your twenty by twenty patch, I've fallen on your new Snapdragon collection, oh. the Summer Pudding collection. Yes. I love I love the title of that, and it's the most gorgeous. The colours are just so me, and I love the names of them: Chantilly Deep Orange and Potomac Deep Orange. Mm. And there's even one called Maryland Flamingo. Yes, with the classic Snapdragon that I always remember you growing, Liberty Liberty Crimson. Yeah, I started growing that thirty years ago. Wow. Yeah. And you've put that they are sort of, you're sort of treating them not as perennials, but they, they go on a lot longer than people think, don't they? Almost like perennials. I, I've been blown away by antirhinums over the last two or three years. Josie and I are actually going to plant a huge, huge patch of them this year because uh, we literally, I sowed them in February, picked them out very easy, quite slow to germinate, but pricked them out three to four mm. weeks later put them out into the garden. They are hardier than most, so they could go out um, end of April. And honestly, honestly, I was still picking vases of those, it, those four together. Oh, certainly till the end of September. I just, we couldn't believe it. As long as we kept picking them or deadheading them, they just kept going. So I think right. that's a, another great, great choice. I, I totally agree with you and would totally um, uh, reinforce that selection. And then for me, more annuals, I really loved growing what is called the Joyful Sweet Pea Collection. And it was this beautiful mix of, of purple and pink and, and sort of dark. So it was quite sort of the classic dark rich palette, but with some brightness in it. And I just found them. They had amazing perfume. They, they just kept going, um, flowering longer than the average sweet pea, which, of course, often have gone over by, well, you know, end of July, haven't they? But but the, the varieties are Amelia Fox, Judith Wil Amelia Fox is crimson purple, Judith Wilkinson is pink, and Winston Churchill is sort of I, I don't know, I think of it like Windsor Castle red, so a really dark rich red. And oh, I love them over a silver birch GP, which you're brilliant at making and they're fun to make. But that for me was very joyful. Yeah, it's a beautiful photo. And I grew Winston Churchill last year and it was so it went on and on, mm. and it, even though I, I, I mean, I was growing them in sort of a friend's garden, so they weren't getting much attention. I was coming and going, mm. and I was absolutely amazed. And it's a wonderful colour to have on its own, or with with Amelia Fox. And we should talk about Amelia Fox because I think yeah. I I sent you a packet yep. a few years ago saying, "Look, I've, this is like Machicana, but it's it's bigger and it's it's taller and and better." And um, it was totally you, Arthur, that introduced me to it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know who bred it, and I don't know if it's named after the actress either, or if there's another Amelia Fox, not the one of Silent Witness. <laughs> but, it must but, be. Um, it's a it's a winner, I think. And if you like Machicana, grow grow both together because you'll get the best of both worlds. Then, because admittedly, 
the scent of Machicana is still a bit stronger, but Amelia Fox is is like the bigger sister, so grow both of them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's definitely it, it's definitely gone to sort of in my top sweet pea varieties. Along mm. actually, this wasn't on my list of what I was meant to be talking about, but I love Erewhon. I don't know if you grew it this year. It's really odd, and that's why I like it. It's sort of um, mauve with blue, and that sounds rather yucky. But when you see it in the garden with a sort of June sky, blue sky behind it, it's absolutely Mm. stunning. So growing on its own or with sort of complementary sort of mauvey purple colours, Erewhon would be another sweet pea that I have to recommend. It's got a good Harry Potter-like name as well, I think. Sounds very mystical. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? No, it's it's a real (laughs) stunner. Um, what next for you, Arthur? Well, I always, I often go on on the, just the gorgeous photos that Jonathan takes, and I wanted to ask you about the Jewel and Enemy collection because mm. it's the most gorgeous photo of these anemones backlit by the spring sunshine. Mm. Bo- Bordex, um, Saint Bridget Red, and Jerusalem Blue, and I know them all, and I know you've got them most in the greenhouse at Perch Hill, but I just wondered if, if maybe if I put a cloche mm. on a bed. Definitely. If I planted the corms, would would the cloche? Do you think you could grow them like using a cloche as a mini cold frame? Yeah. the 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 thing about the anemone coronaries, which are the florist anemones, is that they aren't guaranteed to be hardy in the cold and the wet. So where yeah. I've seen them growing is in um, in the mountains in Crete, where they do get really cold. They're under snow. But then the snow melts and it drains away because it's it's really, you know, it tends to be in limestone rather than mm. in, in more sort of water-holding soils. So what I find is I can perennialize it here in the garden, but I just need to be careful where I put it. So at the bottom of a south-facing wall, perhaps with some builder's rubble underneath, it will be complete perennial. And actually, we've got an X sort of a gritted path in the cutting garden which was a path, just a trodden path for about five years. And then I've, I've, I've just fought that over and I've put them in there. And of course, because it's, you know, half beach really, uh, they've thrived there very much. Oh, that's a good idea. But you do need to then, mul- you know, you need to plant them quite deeply so that they don't get then frosted in the cold weather. Because we tend to have, you know, it will be really cold in the mountains of Creek, but then it goes and it gets a real baking. And that's the thing one has to think about them in their dormant time as well as, as their flowering time. So that's why the drainage is so key to give them that real baking in their, in their dormancy. But we do grow them here. And the picture you're talking about, they're actually totally perennial in those pots. We just have them in wow. um, six or seven terracotta pots. After they finish flowering, we let the leaves die down. We put them back around the back of the polytunnel or into a cold frame and just forget about them until January. And then we bring them out, put them in the greenhouse and off they go again. And what I love, I I know that under a cloche or in a greenhouse or a cold frame, I can get them in flower for Valentine's Day. Because when I used to grow cut flowers commercially, it was one of the things we massively relied on here. Um, but we could have corms planted um, in the greenhouse and we would be able to pick our hearts uh, content away from the middle of February. So yeah, I really recommend them. And I would just uh, not soak them in water overnight. I would just put them on two or three layers of kitchen paper or just a damp tea towel and just dampen it and let them plump up a little bit and then plant them the next day. Oh, excited about those now then. Yeah, Good. they're wonderful. <laughs> um, and mine, funnily enough, because you can do those in autumn or in spring. And actually, uh, by pure chance, my next selection is exactly the same. It's a couple of lilies and you can plant them in autumn or in spring. And they are the, the very perennial, not grown so much for perfume, but for scale and drama and stature and elegance. And I've been growing both of these, Lilium Henryi and Lilium Black Beauty, in the garden now for about 25 years. And they come back every year. They don't seem to get lily beetle. And if they do, it's very minimal. And so it's called our Everlasting Lilies Collection. And they are so statuesque. I've got a clump of both of these growing together down the drive under the chestnut fence. And there I'm pretty sure they're not going to get dug up by by any of us sort of putting in anything else. They're sort of quite hidden. And I just revel in them really sort of from beginning of July right through until September. And uh, they're so statuesque. And I do pick the odd stem, but I always have a rule. And I remember 
um, the head gardener at Susinghurst when we lived there was called Sarah Cook. And I remember her telling me this tip, which I've never forgotten, which is with lilies or fritillaries, they have to have leaf left on the stem if you're using them as a cut flower. So you must divide the stem in thirds and you can cut two thirds, but you've got to leave a third, the leaf section stem, to then photosynthesize and store starch back into the bulb to make them flower the following year. Um, so you must never cut them right to the ground as cut flower growers might do. You're treating them as garden plants. But yeah, those two, Lilium Henry and Black Beauty, absolute corkers. Beautiful. Any more from you, Arthur? I'm just going back to an annual and a dahlia, actually, two, two classic favourites, but I love the fact that they're together. Dahlia Bishop of Auckland and Cosmos Rebenza. And I, I just know they're just beautiful because you've got the the, fo- the the dense foliage of the dahlia, which is dark like kelp, and then the lovely fizz of the cosmos, um, and both incredibly prolific, um, brilliant for pollinators, and the most gorgeous claret, carmine, pink, uh, reds and, and scarlets. So I love the fact that you've put those two together. I think they'd work really well in a in a large pot, or even better, probably as a you know two rows in the cutting garden. They'd look absolutely gorgeous in in full sun. So yeah, that collection I'd probably take to a desert island. Those two plants. So, oh, good. Yeah, yeah no, can't not I, have them. I agree. Wonderful. Well, I've got a couple. Uh, well, a shrub and a climber as my final ones. So first of all, on the shrubs, my mother. Uh, is 94 actually. Uh, she still lives in her house um, in a village called Sheprith, half an hour or 20 minutes outside Cambridge. And uh, when I was growing up, and we still have lining the cobble path up to the front door, it's a beautiful Queen Anne house. She has a tucrium. And do you know, I've been kind of looking for it ever since out of a sense of sort of nostalgia and affection for it. She grows the normal tucrium fruticans. And it's extremely easy to strike from cutting. So it's sort of, if you're thinking kind of lavendery, mediterranean silver silverleaf plants, that's the sort of group that we're talking about. And the, the straight fruticans is really pretty, but it's very sort of washed out denim flower color. Flowers for ages. It's, it gets to about just over a meter, so about 1.2 meters in height and spread. And she had them in big terracotta pots in a yard that was very protected. Um, so as well as down the front path, she had them in a yard in these pots. And I'm sure that the reason they survive, because they're not meant to be at totally massively hardy, but is because it was in this sheltered yard. And they looked so splendid with a euphorbia. So a similar spring flowering euphorbia, or one like Serato Carpa that just flowers and flowers all year. And that was a totally perennial pot. She didn't have to do anything to it. Prune it at the tucrim a bit and you can sort of tidy up the euphorbia. But I loved it. And I that's why I've completely fallen and have ordered a whole load of a brand new variety, which is basically like indigo. And the flowers are indigo colored, so really deep blue purple. But it's called Indio, I-N-D-Y-H-O. And maybe they weren't allowed to call it indigo because there are too many plants called that already. But it's fabulous. I saw the dark blue form in this absolutely fantastic garden designed by Tanya Compton. And the the house and garden is called Ilias, and it's owned by a couple called the Henages. And it's the most beautiful, beautiful house and the most beautiful garden in the Marnie, uh, just above Cardamili. And there they have Teucrium, Euphorbias, Lavender, sages, balotta, all those Mediterranean things, but merge into this unbelievably beautiful, drought-tolerant, flowery, pollinator-rich carpet, which apparently is relatively low maintenance. Oh, yes, and with rosemary too. And the tucrium, the dark blue form that I've just talked about, is the absolute jewel in the crown. It's just fantastic. Mm, it's so nice that you remember that from, is it childhood you remember that from? Yeah, completely. Seeing it. Yeah. Oh. And going back to see my mother's garden, and it's still there, sort of thriving, absolutely thriving. So uh, one more from you, Arthur, and then maybe I'll just finish. One more. We could we could go on because there's so much. I know. <laughs> um, but the I'm going to end with a, a, a shrub, which I'm excited to see because um, a bit like you, n- nostalgia with shrubs is interesting, isn't it? I remember my granddad Ted and my grandma Sheila had a very large fuchsia bush outside their back door. And I remember being little and squeezing the the seed pods 
that are almost like grapes, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> but this was a huge thing. And um, a few years ago now, I remember this this fuchsia being at Perth Chill. It had freshly arrived to, yeah. be, to be photographed. It's called Dying Embers. Mm. And it's the most beautiful, delicate fuchsia. And I love the fact that, that fuchsias can cope with a bit of shade. Yeah. So I think I'm going to add a fuchsia to the, the front door, which, which is very shady. We've got hostas and ferns there. And I love the idea of, of something a bit more floral being there. And we have it here in a pot. And mm. I'm not exaggerating that when I went away for Christmas in 23, it was still in flower. So we had wow. brought it into the greenhouse undercover. But, and then you can make it into a house plant. I, I agree. It's an absolutely cracking plant. Oh, well, I can't wait for that then. Even better if it flowers into the winter and can be, become a house plant. Wonderful. Really, it would suit you you in the cottage so well, I think. Mm. So my my final one is, I mean, we're it's incredibly exciting that we've just bought Taylor's clematis recently at the end of last year. So one of the things Josie and I have been doing is going through and selecting more and more clematis than we grow already here to put in the different areas of the garden. Because as you know, Arthur, each area of the garden has got a different palette. And one of the areas that I really want to embellish more is the farmhouse garden, which is a soft, cool palette. So it's white, mauves and pinks, which are colours that you and I struggle most with. But I've really fallen on this viticella clematis, and I love them because they're just so easy to look after and they don't tend to get any sort of form of disease, which some of the more tender ones can do. But viticella sea breeze is as it sounds. You, you sort of, when you look at it, it looks like it's the sort of sea merging into the sky on a, on a June day. Very, very flowery, long flowering. So from June right through to the end of September. And I've seen it in a trial and I love it. When it first comes out, it's got a sort of real green tinge to the flower, which is so pretty. And the, the center of the flower remains green. Brilliant for pollinators. I think a lot of people don't realize that clematis are very, very good, particularly for pollen. They've got really pollen rich anthers. So fantastic for bees to get their protein, which of course is what they get from pollen. So I'm going to make three teepees in the farmhouse garden and on each of them and along the front fence, actually, I'm going to have uh, Clematis viticella sea breeze. Mm, lovely. That'll be very cloudy and elegant. Yeah, I reckon. Mm. Thanks so much for listening to Arthur and myself going through our absolute tip-top favourites of the spring and summer things that we're planting. And next week, it's International Women's Day. So we're going to go through the female entrepreneurs and horticulturalists I've interviewed over the last year or so as themes in the podcast and have clips from them and why they are such inspiring women. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.